So weighing in on the subject, the mystery of suffering is the challenge you gave me tonight, and God bless you for that. I will pray for your souls for giving probably the hardest topic to talk about imaginable. And I'll work up to that challenge shortly, but I'd like just to preface my comments with a couple, uh, a couple observations, and they're taken from, first of all, Peter Kreef's classic commentary on suffering, making sense of suffering. You want to pick up a, a nice short overview of it. Uh, it's one of the best treatises by a major philosopher and theologian who's taught at Boston College. And uh, just a quick summary of what he says in that book, um, basically that there are three kinds of evil in the world. There's suffering, which is, a, he says, a disharmony or an alienation between ourselves as embodied creatures and something in this physical world. So there's a disconnect between ourselves and something we're dealing with in our lives, and that causes us suffering. We're not able to relate to that whatever very well, and that's, that's that disharmony in our lives. Number two, there's the evil of death, which is the disharmony or alienation or separation between, between the soul and the body, our souls and body, when they're disconnected at that end of our life, the termination of life. And finally, there's the evil of sin, which is the disharmony or alienation between, between the soul and God. So a disconnect, a, a failure of a relationship uh, that happens between ourselves and God, and that is uh, the evil of sin. So suffering is one of these three evils that he talks about. And uh, he suggests, um, he such, suggested at the time this book was written, and that's over 20 years ago, 1986, that people are hurting far more psychologically and spiritually than ever before. That's an interesting comment people are hurting far more psychologically and spiritually than ever before. I lift up the Birmingham News, read it every day, and I can't believe the number of tragedies in our own backyard happening every day. It's just astronomical. That's just Birmingham. <laughs> Suicides, he says, are up. Depression is up. Mindless violence is up. Boredom, he says, is up. I, I think that's an interesting, it's been an, uh, hours on just on what, why people are bored. But he says the very word boredom does not exist in any pre-modern language. <laughs> boredom has been invented by us. <clears throat> Loneliness is up. Drug escapism is up. And for the past almost 25 years, I have had the experience of working with uh, people escaping through addictions. And you could spend hours just on that alone. Tomorrow I'll be offering a mass uh, for the birthday of one of the leaders of that community we have brought to the United States, the Chinacolo, Albino Aranio, and he was a major drug pusher himself. But he, he had a major conversion through the community, and he's been been the leader of the community in this part of the world. So I've, I've seen that it's possible to reverse <coughs> the directions, but awfully, awfully hard, and you have to be really, really committed to get out of the world of escapism that is drugs. <clears throat> Peter Kreef moves to a resolution of his discussion of the very mystery of suffering when he writes, many things that I say I know by faith, not by experience, but what I say now I know both by faith and by experience. So as a scientist, as a researcher, as a philosopher, he has a lot of things that he's discovered in that role as philosopher and theologian, but also by the experience of life. And this, I think, is one of his key insights. He says, the, the way to perfect joy is incredibly simple. It is simply to die, <clears throat> to die to self-will and self-regard to say to God, thy will be done, and truly mean it. <clears throat> to put God first, to, um, to consecrate everything, everything to him. That's his basic philosophy of how you find 
meaning and suffering and how you discover joy in life. I'm going to read that one more time. The way to perfect joy is incredibly simple. It is simply to die, to die to self, to self-will and self-regard, to say to God, thy will be done, and mean it, to put God first, to consecrate everything, everything to him. Okay, now that's simple, but how challenging it is. And of course, we're in Lent now, so we're hearing that theme, aren't we? We're going to hear it all over the place in our scriptures. You have to read his book to, to appreciate all that he has to say, but I think this last point is among most important. And I myself uh, came to uh, learn the lesson he talks about by personal experience in a hospital bed, bed at St. Vincent's Hospital, uh, in a special way in the fall of 2014. I had been in, in the hospital the year before with uh, back surgery, but this other event was much more um, meaningful to me in understanding what he's writing about in this book. <clears throat> the way to perfect joy in life is simply to die, to die to self-will and self-regard and to say to God, as of course Mary did, thy will be done, and to truly mean that, to put God first, to consecrate everything, everything to him. So that's my talk in a nutshell. Okay. Now let's flesh it out a little bit. <clears throat> so I was taken to the hospital. I had just been celebrating Mass with Father Donahoe at uh, his mission church, uh, St. Mary's, and I was running off the altar all the time. I was having, celebrating con confirmation, the sacrament of confirmation, and I barely made it through the Mass, and after the Mass, he and my, the driver of the day was Dominic Virile. I'm fortunate to have many people that drive me around to these confirmations, and Dominic was the one, and they said, you gotta go to the hospital. <laughs> and so they got a hold of a doctor who was able to get me into the emergency room at St. Vincent's on that, I believe it was a Sunday. And they got me into the, uh, well, the, the room for analysis, and the doctor's eyes seemed to bulge as he told me that I had acute kidney failure and you better call the priest. Well, Father Booth was over there right away. And uh, I'm so grateful to him. Uh, it was the perfect storm. I've had stones before, but I told him, I think it's probably kidney stone somewhere affecting me. <clears throat> now, I don't want to get into all the details of all that, but two of them dropped down in both ureters. You can handle one, but if you have two, then you have no function of your kidneys. So that's what happened. And uh, so the diagnosis I took, strangely, with a measure of composure, thanks to Father Booth showing up right away and giving me the last rites. Now, the last rites are not just the anointing of the sick, it's, you know, you're also giving an apostolic pardon and all that. And there's a real sense of peace. When the priest comes and he only gives you anointing of sick and you're really bad off, say, Father, I know in your little book there's some other prayers. <laughs> say them all. I want them all. And one of them is an apostolic pardon, which is a plenary indulgence, and it presumes certain things, like you've been to confession and you're totally separate from sin. Well, that was not the last time I had the last rites in the hospital. Father Lambert Greenan, he's pushing 100, he's 99. He got out of his room and he came over also twice to give me the last rites. So they wheeled me into that, uh, that Sunday evening in the operating room and they were able to put stents in both of my uh, ureters, I guess that's what they call them, allowing the blockages to be bypassed and my kidneys to function once again, but it was a temporary move because uh, there was a massive amount of fluid. I don't know if they took out two quarts but of fluid from my system. Back in the hospital room, I was uh, given the hope of their removing the actual stones that still lodged there by a future surgery. And uh, that was the prospect, and they said, you know, it looks good, you'll be able to get them out eventually. Well, what happened then was I, I, I got a staph infection in my hospital stay, and that's a major infection that leaves um, your body very vulnerable even to terminal illness. So then I spent some time there trying to get over that infection. And uh, Deacon Terry, Rumor Rita, uh, some of you, other clergy, 
uh, religious lay ministers and family came by to bring me their support and their prayers. And I'm deeply grateful, and I know from, I have visited people so many times, but when you're in there, it's a different story. It's almost so real when you're really there. <laughs> you know, you say, uh, this is a whole other story of my life. And it just seems, if I look back there, that it was, I was in another world. Father Booth, once again, I want to thank you for your time there. And, and he wanted to be sure I prayed the liturgy, the hours with him, and you know, kept up. <clears throat> when you're in <clears throat> a state of severe illness, prayer is hard, and you need it more than anything. But um, I struggled with, you know, just praying. I couldn't even. I couldn't even. My I couldn't even pray out loud. Deacon Terry tried to. He would pray the rosary with me, <laughs> and uh, it was. I couldn't even get the words out. Amazingly, through it all, I had a deep feeling of being resigned to God's will. I told Deacon Terry and family members that I was, quote, detached. I would suppose detachment in that sense of Peter Kreef's dying to self-will and self-regard and saying yes to God. I thought I had that pretty well down, and I felt that spirit. I hadn't read Peter Kreef's book then, but a real sense of detachment came over me and gave me peace. This was, I was feeling that. Days and nights passed, and I managed to uh, experience a deep composure and a feeling of detachment. And then all of a sudden, it all changed. <clears throat> it changed when I, I learned that after almost a month in the hospital, my planned surgery was uh, having to be canceled because my white blood cell count was too low. Then I wasn't so composed or detached at all because I knew if I didn't get out of that, didn't have that surgery, I would never exit the hospital alive. Panic and fear set in. I just had to have that surgery. My life depended on it, and I would not take no for an answer. But the doctors around me, my sister's a nurse, says, you'll never make it. You can't move ahead with this, you're just going to have to postpone it. And um, I started praying pretty heavily, but there was a doctor that finally came in that said, I think I can help you, I can put you on a medication that will possibly lift your white blood cell count and enable you to have surgery, and fortunately I was able to do that. And I, I had a statue in my room of that belonged at one time to Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Uh, the uh, Franciscan missionaries had it in their house. They brought it over and it was there. And then they, they put me on the international Sheen prayer list and I received a relic of Sheen's as well. So when I was going into surgery, well, first of all, I told my doctor, who is not Catholic, his name is Dr. Holly, about Sheen. And uh, I said, now if I go into that surgery and there's no stones and I was having a prostate surgery and one other surgery, if I come out, there's no problem. That's a miracle. It's a miracle. And so I said, then, you know, that's for, for Sheen's cause. He says, that means I get to go to Rome? And I, if, if you're, I said, yes, and I'll pay your way. So, <laughs> well, he was so good. And you know how these surgeries go. You're not allowed to take things in there with you. So, but he pinned, he pinned a little relic of Sheen on my uh, gown as I went in. And he came in that, that morning. Uh, all these doctors were looking at my blood count and everything else. Have you ever had a stroke? Have you ever this? It almost looked like they were going to say no to the surgery. But I, I once again felt some composure right there. And I told the doctor, who hadn't slept much the night before, um, I think he had to just, his wife had a baby recently, you all know how that is, he didn't sleep well, and that's, I normally would panic if I knew that, but I told him, it's going to go well, it's going to go well, not to worry, Bishop Sheen is with us. So I just had that feeling. And then, so I had a three-way surgery, three in one, and Deacon Terry was there, my sister had to return home, my brother had to return home. So I'm grateful to the rumors for being with me in that time. And so Terry's outside the operating room, and the doctor calls him after each one of these three surgeries. It worked, it worked, it worked. And so 
I got out of there, and um, I thanked Dr. Holly for letting me uh, have the intercession of Archbishop Sheen, and I just propose him to you if you're ever in that situation. <laughs> he needs a miracle for his cause. So, <laughs> hope it's you. So the surgery was a success, all three phases, but unfortunately, um, another thing hit me afterwards, it was pulmonary embolisms, and I had, I'm still on, on medication for that. But um, I'm back on my feet, and um, I was able then to get into my residence, uh, slowly recover, and as I mentioned, I'm still on the medications for all that stuff, but, um, you know, it's a minor miracle I'm still alive. The point of this drawn-out narrative has to do with my failure to actually be as detached as I pride in myself on being. <laughs> oh, I am so good and holy, I am so detached. But in reality, I was very much attached to this world and my material existence. To the point that when Sister Mary Michael, the superior at the time of the Poor Clares of Perpetual Adoration, she left, uh, came out of the, the monastery to come to visit me, and I said, Sister Mary Michael, I thought I was detached, but I really wasn't. And she made this profound comment I will never forget. She said, Bishop, it takes a lifetime to become detached. It takes a lifetime to become detached. Well, I thought she hit the nail on the head of the mystery of suffering. You don't get there overnight. Pride can get in the way, whatever. Only Jesus and the saints were fully detached, and I had a long way to go. Probably God left me here to allow him time to work more on me with the virtue of detachment. Even before my own confrontation with suffering and death back in 2014, I had witnessed, witnessed the death, the deaths of my mother, two brothers, and a sister-in-law, all in a few years span of time. My brother Jim was the first of, of the four to die, and he and I were really close. And it was a sad and difficult time for me in a special way, but all of us. As Jim lay there dying, I gave him the theology of suffering, the meaning of suffering from a book knowledge. I told him that he was the person of Christ for us as he united his sufferings to the suffering of Christ. And we were like John, Mary, and the other women for him. We were like those women at the foot of the cross. We were with him, sharing in his passion, not running away at a difficult time, we were embracing his cross with him. Hopefully, it was making a difference for him to know we were there suffering with him. That's compassion. Huh? That's sharing in another person's suffering. And um, while I said those words to him, I had, I had this pectoral cross on. This is my pectoral cross. And that's the cross of San Damiano. And that's one I like because it has, it has Mary and John and the other woman at the foot of the cross. I think that's so instructive that somebody stuck around with Jesus um, and told him, you know, they supported him with compassion. So the cross, the Franciscan cross, uh, not, not only has Christ superimposed on the cross, but also the disciples, John, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other woman at the foot of the cross. I told Jim he couldn't keep this. I needed to wear it. I put it over his head. But I had another smaller version of that cross that I placed over him. He grabbed a hold of it in his suffering, and he wore it to his death. Now, Jim's wife, Linda, was devastated by his death. And so she had that cross placed over him in the, in the nice suit he wore and in the casket, and it went with him to his grave as a sign that we were with him in his passion and in his death. Now some of you know Michael Dubrail. Michael served, he worked for me for a while and he was a writer and he wrote a beautiful book, The Power of the Cross. <clears throat> I recommend that also as, as good reading for Lent. 
And he says in his book, the cross is the school of love. It transforms how we look at God, the world, and everyone around us. <clears throat> Nailed to the cross with Jesus, we sometimes have faith enough to hear him promise, this day you will be with me in paradise. This day you will be with me in paradise. Others, he said, simply curse God for not taking them down off the cross. Ultimately, it's the Lord himself and the great saints of the church who teach us how to embrace suffering and the cross and to grow in detachment from all things that separate us from God. <clears throat> I love the beautiful testimony of St. Bernadette Subaru. If you get Magnificat, you saw it the other day. It's, we just celebrated the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, and that was one of the meditations. Um, I think we see how far you have to go to reach true happiness as you listen to her words. I think they're so powerful. She writes a little testimony after all the things she experienced in life. She says, for the extreme poverty of my father and mother, the failure of the mill where his father, her father worked, the wood that brought unhappiness, the wine of fatigue, the dirty sheep, thank you, my God. For the extra mouth to be fed that I was, for the ragged children, for the sheep that I watched, thank you. Thank you, my God, for the procurator, the superintendent of police, the policeman, and for Abby Pyramalis, that's apparently your pastor, for their harsh words. For the days when you came, Our Lady Mary, for the days when you did not come, only in paradise can I give you thanks. <clears throat> for the slap in the face, for the bantering, the insults, for those who believed I was crazy, for those who believed I was lying, for those who believed I was greedy, thank you, Lady Mary. <clears throat> for the spelling I never learned, the knowledge of books I never had, for my ignorance and my stupidity, thank you. Thank you, thank you, because had there been in this world a girl more ignorant and stupid than I, you would have chosen her. Wow, isn't that pretty profound? That's the level, I guess, you know, we have to get to to say we're really, really detached. Um, no one, according to Alfred Depp, Delp, a German Jesuit priest who was, was um, condemned to death by the Nazis in Berlin, Germany, he said, no one can escape the hour of temptation. It's only in that hour we begin to sense our weakness and to have a faint inkling of the vital decisions we're expected to make. If only I can manage to keep hold on this perilous perch and not faint and let go. I have committed my soul to God and I rely on the help of my friends. <clears throat> the 18th century Jesuit theologian and spiritual writer, he's also a good resource on this whole subject, Jean-Pierre de Cossade, his book, Abandonment to Divine Providence. It has it all kind of there on how we discover, uh, how we discover the ability to be detached and how we put ourselves in the present moment of our lives and make the present moment the opportunity for the grace of God. Because we can only experience detachment, we live in the here and now. So he says, we must keep ourselves detached from all we feel or do if we are to travel along the path and live only for God and the duties of the present moment. There's never a moment when God does not come forward in the guise of some suffering or some duty and that all that takes place within us, around us, and through us both includes and hides his activity. <clears throat> suffering, my dear friends, is always going to be there. And the other side of the suffering, the other flip side is that God is always there too with every bit of suffering we experience. And he wants us to use that suffering as a means of detachment. Um, I'm going to invite you maybe to react a little bit in terms of uh, motherhood or fatherhood, the fathers are here, in terms of your own experiences because you're going to approach this in a different way than I do. <laughs> We kind of have the theories that these people map out, but it's only in the struggle of the present moment 
whatever that present moment is that we really experience the cross and the redemptive power of the cross as we embrace it or as we reject it. As we mentioned before, as we link our cross with Jesus and he tells us this day will be with me in paradise, so we say, get me off here quick, uh, like the other, the other thief said on the cross. So I just want to end by thanking my family and friends, Father Booth, uh, all the people who are the rumors and others like yourselves who were with me in my suffering in that uh, dark valley of the shadow of death as I tried to keep a hold on that perilous perch to remain detached and not faint and let go. I thank you for all your prayers, past and present, and may God continue to help us in this time of Lent to understand better uh, the mystery of the cross and the mystery of redemption that comes to us from embracing and being detached. And that is a mystery, and we could talk for, about it forever, so maybe we just uh, opened up a little bit more that great mystery tonight, and we've helped you a little bit along the line in accepting your crosses, embracing them, and being detached. Thank you, my Lord. Thanks, everyone. God bless you. But I know, too, the reality is you women and men out there in your family life, which is, um, is touching suffering every day and embracing it every day. And it's in relationships and um, it's in the concrete experience of marriage uh, that, that you experience the redemptive power of the cross. So I, I would like to also just throw out to you that question, uh, maybe if there's no specific uh, comments at this point, but Dr. Kreef's suggestions that people are hurting far more psychologically and spiritually than ever before, his um, suggestion that suicides are up, depression is up, mindless violence is up, boredom is up, loneliness is up, drug escapism, escapism is up. Um, and what that means in concrete in the whole area of the mystery of suffering. Anybody want to comment or react? Feel free. And let's just say it's a, it's a dialogue. We're in a dialogue. Father Booth is teaching me. He's saying today a dialogue is important. You can come forward. There's a little microphone here that maybe I, we can hear each other on an important subject and help each other in embracing our own crosses. Do you want me to just talk into this? Yes, that's okay. fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny that you would mention that prayer by like, Bernadette in the Magnificat, because I had read that myself. And um, <laughs> at first, when I first read that prayer, the one thank you for the slap in the face and all that kind of thing, I actually prayed and I said, please help me to be more like you because I don't feel like that, you know, to pray like thank you for the insults or things like that. And um, so I tried to understand her stance um, to be, like you said, detached. But then I had this, um, and you can correct me theologically if this is incorrect, but I had this thought that um, when Christ was on the cross and he was hanging there, he didn't necessarily, I mean, he is the realest person that there is, I suppose you could say, but when he was hanging, suffering on the cross, he didn't look up and say, thank you, God, for all the suffering. Thank you, God, for the slaps and the spits in the face. And he didn't really say that. I mean, he, he accepted the cross, but he didn't actually say thank you. So he, and he was real. He suffered and he felt pain, but um, I guess what I thought to myself is that he felt suffering, and it was really real to him. Um, so I guess there's some realism there. But I think, good point. I think with her too, there was uh, realism to what she had to face. Like with him, Eli Eli Lemesabaktani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words are there. And um, I, I, I wrote a little book on the questioner's prayer that, that's all through the Bible, and people can ask questions as a sign of faith, but they're not doubting that God is with them either. In other words, Mary, how is this possible? I do not know man. Yeah. She wasn't saying that she didn't embrace God's will 
uh, the fiat, but she was saying, can you explain this to me a little better? And so I think, I think that those words of Jesus are deliberately there for us to realize how deep the pain was. But he was embracing it all, and he, he had the power to say no right away. I mean, he didn't have to go on that cross. He did not have to do that. So um, did he not embrace it? Was he not detached? Was he totally detached? Oh, he was totally detached. Mm -hmm. It's the word he's quoting also a psalm in that. Why Eli Eli Lema Sabachthani? He's quoting a psalm, and he's identifying with the, the depth of the pain. So I think you can uh, be detached in a sense while you, but you also experience the tremendous pain that's there. And you're saying that that can't defeat me. If I'm detached from it, like she is, it can't defeat her. Being stupid, dumb, the, the dumbest person she said she was did not, did not make her uh, hate herself right. so she embraced that. she embraced it yeah, yeah but I, it, it, it's still a mystery i'm not answering your question but i'm trying to walk around it a little bit to say right. you can do both you can thank god for for your crosses and and so i guess it's and you but and, and she uh, the, the thing is she, she definitely experienced pain as as jesus did so it's not walking away from, this is the, the the thing is escapism all those things you see suicides and all these other in some sense drugs are all escapes from accepting the cross I every guess, one of them I guess one thing I was thinking almost the way that she was saying it St. Bernadette was almost it sounded almost a little Pollyannish thank you thank you for the slap thank you for it almost all sounded a little mm -hmm. Pollyannish like you know and and I was saying how can I how can I be like that how can I brace it so suffering so well that you thank you thank you for the slap hit me again you know and, and mm -hmm. but Jesus he wasn't like that he was real he suffered he was hurting he was in pain um, but, but uh, like you said he she did suffer and she was it was real to well her. I don't have a real answer for that but I, the yeah. question itself you're asking yeah. take it back to the Lord through Lent yeah. and, and, uh, <laughs> and put it into the context of your situations and like Lord give me wisdom to know how do I do this and my little book how the questioner's prayer that's a good question how do I do that so it's not Pollyannish but it's real huh and then it it's saving and it's not self-destructive or you know uh, sadistic you know that that it can be a, can be that way it's like you know being in the hospital and I was, I was kind of Pollyannish myself. Then the reality hit me. And then I, have to, I had to reevaluate. And, and, and here's where the, the answer I got to that kind of question was Sister Mary Michael's point. It takes a lifetime to learn that. And we're, we're struggling. We think we have it together, and we don't. And we have some other crisis that helps us understand better. Thank you. Good. I had something I wanted to add to her comment, actually. Um, it was something I had read in a book called Humility of Heart by Father Tabernmo, I think is his name. Um, but he was talking about humility and being, you know, grateful for insults and those kinds of things. And he said, it's like the, the crux of humility is that when we're insulted, we recognize that we deserved it. And it's like, we don't deserve anything better than insults. We have no goodness and merit of our own. And so when someone insults us, we should be grateful that it's reminding us that we really don't deserve anything better. But then contrasting that to Christ on the cross, he didn't deserve any of that. He was goodness itself. So he didn't have to be thankful for God for putting him in his place. He just had to willingly do it because he loved us. And so I just, I thought that sort of okay. uh, applied to the situation. I think it does. You're, it's a good point, the humility. Tomorrow's gospel is on prayer. Uh, uh, ask it, it shall be given to you. Seek and shall find and all that. And Jesus is saying if you pray that your prayers will be answered. And um, it's interesting, but you, you have to have a humble prayer. You have to have a sincere prayer. Um, and you have to have persistent prayer, too. You keep praying all along. <laughs> so, like, my 
drug addict friends that are recovering, they're in a situation now where they're doing all that, pray the rosary three times a day, Eucharist regularly, confession regularly, but then when they leave community, they can fall off that wagon and they, they fall off prayer, they fall off uh, the Eucharist, they fall off going to confession, they, the, the rosary, and they lose the grip with what they had. So, and then I think the honesty and humility that was part of their prayer before they lose to, we lose to. So all those things have to be part of that prayer for the prayer to get, to bring us to what we, we should be praying for. Saint um, John Vianney says, well, every prayer he thinks will be answered We'll get uh, what we ask for if we ask with a sincere heart. We'll, we won't ask for dumb things <laughs> you know, if we have a sincere heart. But a humble heart, too, as you're saying, has to be there. And those are the lessons. We're all on that pathway. But thank God we have the saints, right, for our models, the beautiful example of, of her. I think it's instructive, though, that those things that would tear us apart didn't tear her apart. She had that, such that simple, simple soul that she was so detached from everything that when, when something happened to her, it didn't blow her mind. She, she just took it and translated it in a constructive way. But I, the other thing you all have to deal with is I, I, I live a celibate life, so you're living a married life. You bring those dimensions into your relationships huh? with your husbands, wives, and children. And that, you know, you translate that concretely and, and that's why your, your work with each other is important to share some of those experiences concretely. How do you deal with them? And with the children, with their sicknesses, with a husband, with uh, whatever, um, that's all critical. Can I ask you though, what I in that quote from Kreeft that um, he believes that, that the uh, people are struggling now more than in the past. Does, do you think that's true? And, and one of the things I have to say, Father, when I was in your culture in India, it was like a different experience of life, the Asian or the Eastern. Um, and, I, and I have to be careful drawing conclusions, but they have a little bit easier access to the transcendent than we do because we have more of a material, secular society than they do. There's a lot more of the poverty experience in, in the Indian culture. Not that there isn't a lot of wealth, but we don't realize sometimes how enmeshed we are in a secular environment. And I wonder if that has destroyed so many of our young people. One of the young men who used to be with us in community, he fell afterwards and he's in a program now and I see him regularly. It's not ours. He just told me, my 15th friend just died of an overdose. One of my friends is in prison for murder, killed his wife. That's not the first time I've heard that. And I heard it from a young man from here in Birmingham has 12 friends that overdosed and died. Now. I, it wasn't a world I grew up in, but I'm telling you, there's some endemic, difficult situations that your children are thrown into automatically in our culture. And, and I think where you men and women can delve into this is to say what and why. Why are there, why are there seminaries full? Why are there convents full? I'll say you one other example of suffering and how they deal with it and you are all part of the pro-life movement, but when in America, if there's something shows up on the, um, help me on that, what he's, the screen, on the ultrasound, we abort 95 probably percent of the people here. Not true in India. Their church, their dioceses have programs where they have loads of sisters working with um, people that were born deformed some in their 20s and 30s that still live and live in a bed. They have strapped down somewhat, but they have taken care of by their people. I said, well, I don't remember seeing this in the United States. And somebody said, well, that's because most are aborted. 
this is the culture we're in, that's the culture they're in. And it's more sensitive to life. Now, what do we do when there's pain or suffering? We run from it, don't we? We don't embrace it or try to correct it. It's endemic in the Western culture. How do we get over that? Well, we start at home, but uh, I, was with, I was talking with a sister whose brother is Down syndrome, and she reminded me that uh, Father Cullen in our diocese works with Down syndrome children. He and her sister Vernon, so they are directly attacking that sense that these people have no worth. But most people are not doing that. Unless the church responds positively to help, unless you and I say we're going to help those families. The drug addicts, I fell into that, but I can tell you the Catholic Church is not out front in helping addicted people. Salvation Army is out front and other groups. You want to, if you're 24 hours a day, you can walk into the Salvation Army rehab. I have great respect for them. I don't agree with their theology. It's a church, but they're ahead of us church-wise to deal with the addict in our midst. So the people that are struggling, how do we help them? How do we respond? And um, if we have that happen in our own family, how do we deal with it? Huh? Go to India. I was just overwhelmed by all the places, like where he's from, or close by the diocese over, to massive programs. AIDS patients, leprosy, they have religious brothers and sisters that are right there. And they have the religious vocations 10 times more than we do almost. But it's a cultural thing. Did you want to add something to that? Yeah, go ahead, sure. We're talking about escaping from suffering. The answer to that question, why now, has it escalated to such a point? Yes. And just from, just one thought I had was it is indeed the culture of life that when you walk away from that, then there seems to be this ripple effect of mm -hmm. um, evil and sadness and uh, despair and hopelessness and so, lack of meaning yes and if and you know that's why like Gwen and I have a sidewalk council for years but it's just to try to save that whole uh, family from a ripple effect of death and discouragement and mm -hmm. uh, we have when we were had our uh, we adopt an hour our conference journey of Christian mothers and it's amazing what a witness the mothers and children have that children are a gift and it's beautiful and that's what gives you joy in life. So that's just one mm -hmm. thought was it's really this culture of death has had this massive effect on our culture. And I commend you for that, what you women are doing, amen. And then uh, what uh, the prices did when they helped set up her choice, setting in motion an alternative huh? that you rescue people and then you follow up with a concrete activity that's that's powerful yes come so how do we how do we counter suffering problems with meaning in life just to kind of add to what Jenny said and, and then another thing but with this the culture of death when we think about all the babies that have been aborted you know, the God takes care of them, but then think about our world, and I don't know how, in, in India how abortion, how, how it sounds like it's, you're, you're better there. But think about all the, in fact, I said to somebody one time that was post-aborted, I said, if we just have the walking wounded. I mean, if we have 47 million that we know of since Roe, mm -hmm. then you multiply all the women and men that are carrying that cross and I said to her, I said, it's like we're, we're a nation of walking wounded. And she said, oh, no, Gwen, we're the walking dead. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you, you think about, they're, and then they're, they're having to suffer in silence. So, so we have that level of uh, suffering.
that's in silence, so they're stuffing with the alcohol or whatever it is they numb out on, or you know they do cutting and just all in suicide, mm -hmm. and and then we just experienced in, in St. Paul's they they had the funeral, but at the Planned Parenthood here we had uh, they have security guards, which we're blessed that they're there because they're really taking care of us, but. Um, Mike, the guard that we got to know real well, he committed suicide in December the 15th, and then his young bride, Angie, four weeks later in January, committed suicide. And we would we talked to them and we're mm -hmm. close to them, but I mean, but they were, you know, it's real people you knew, good, you know, oh. you don't know what that is. But. No, exa no, I don't. But but a uh, good point. And I talking to this young man who said I had 15 friends who overdosed and died, I just said, look, oh my, those wonderful lives that could have been there and they're gone, that they could have contributed something to society, they're lost. That's tragic, 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 but it's all over the place. And you mentioned those people. So the culture, in, is, is John Paul, St. John Paul II's point is the culture of death. I'm going to come back on a hope. Well, we're going to leave on a hopeful note. I hope we can. Yes. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I just wanted to comment that just taking all this in as a mother, and you know, just everything that we face, what we're going to be raising our children in this culture, it is very dark. And I think as Christian mothers, we have to work harder in this day and age. We have to be more vigilant. And um, and looking outside of ourselves, especially for the best interest of our kids and being supportive. Um, I think all of these suicides, it's such a tragedy because, you know, if people were outside of themselves and, and, and were there to show support, a lot of these tragedies wouldn't happen. Just like, you know, with the Chinaclo community, what you do to build up those men and they had that support system, maybe they didn't have that growing up and it's what, it's what heals them and helps them, you know, create a life that does have hope and give them a future, you know, outside of their addictions. I'm working with some women right now that are in recovery and I just see the support is just critical for them and the prayer life and just spreading the gospel and just, you know, you're, you're giving them an example and giving them a hope. Um, I, on a personal note, I, I have five children living, and um, I had a shock and awe child at the age of 42. She's, she'll be two, two years old next at the end of next month. And when I conceived her, I mean, it was really shock and awe. <laughs> you know, my, the one before that was four, and I didn't think I could really have any more children. So, um, you know, I went to try to find a support group online, you know, one night, and God really had a sense of humor with me because I was feeling like, oh gosh, this is so much, I need support, and I was looking for other Catholic Christian moms, and what I found was really astounding that, you know, 60% of women in that age bracket that conceive abort their child, and I was reading all these blogs of these women's and all their reasons that they weren't going to have their child, and it was like God wanted me to see. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so much better off than I thought I was. I don't have that problem. Like, I'm not even questioning if I'm going to have the child. But then my heart was so heavy that, gosh, these women, they, you could just see in what they were saying in the sentiment, they didn't have a support system. They, they were so lost and they felt like they were all alone. It was just too much that they could endure. So, you know, I just feel God is speaking in my life. It's like he's bringing humility. I think the love and the suffering and humility, it all goes together. Mm -hmm. You know, if Christ had to suffer to give himself and show us love, and he humbled himself, he chose that, it's through humility. And God's working on me that way too. You know, he's bringing me to humility. But I see Christ and others through that suffering. Mm -hmm. And maybe the Lord's calling you to reach out to those mothers in that age bracket that are contemplating right. abortions. Um, you know, creativity your, yourselves, as I mentioned, the prices, see the need for getting her choice off the ground. Sometimes the Lord puts that on our hearts. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention that uh, my grandmother, when she was uh, con conceived, my father, 
he was the, she was 42 or 43. And the doctor said, abort him. And um, she just said, I know more than the doctor knows about this. And I'm not going to follow his advice. And my dad was born. I wouldn't be here if the doctor's advice were followed. But um, I, I think I, I praise the women who were courageous enough to break through the barriers of bad advice. Yes, and, and you did it. You know, that hits a chord with me, too, because after I had that child, my baby, Mary Catherine, I conceived again after that. And sadly, I miscarried that child. But when I went to the hospital, I had never miscarried a child. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the hospital and I told the emergency room doctor that I was thought I was miscarrying, he said, well, how old are you? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm 43. And um, I said, I have a child at home that's, you know, five months old. I, this is my sixth child, my sixth pregnancy. And he said, well, how old are you? And I told him, he said, you're too old to be having babies. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and my friend was with me. I was in shock because I was mm -hmm. having a miscarriage. And, I, and he goes, no, really, you're too old to be having babies. And I thought, God, help. That's what the, the doctor told my grandmother, yes. And how many women would abort their child because of the influence of that doctor, you know? Mm -hmm. And I pray for that. I felt like, well, maybe God wanted me to know that that doctor was out there to pray for him. So it's a culture of death, and, and, and you're the ones that, how to figure out how we, uh, how we raise our children in the culture of life, because all those kind of decisions are affecting your children. They're brought in culture that predominantly tells them a lie and we have to get the truth out there and I get back to you mentioned the drug addicts and your help with people like their addictions mother Elvira had a sixth grade education she was not trained to be a, a, a drug counselor but she had a sense of helping people you don't have to have a lot of education to do things like that and her superior told her that she couldn't do this because she wasn't trained and she just badgered for five years. There's a meeting going on tomorrow of leaders of parents around, or individuals that head up the support groups for parents around this country that work with them. And they're having a retreat now, and those are people whose lives have been changed. A couple of, in the, in the group, they're not making this, but they had three boys, uh, one, two were addicted and one was killed in a car accident, and the family was devastated, and that nun's effort helped them through the crisis. And the two boys were helped by the community. But um, people have to find ways, you know, and as I say, you don't have to have a PhD or an MD to do that. You just have a, have, have a heart to figure out the ways. And the Lord puts these things on our hearts, as he does with you people that are doing the street counseling. I think we better wind out. I could keep you here all night, but this is a mystery we're talking about. We can't forget that. We'll never totally solve it. Thank you.